The commission also found we had a uh, exchange with Russian generals who were some of their leading experts on EMP and their leading nuclear strategists disclosed to the EMP commission in 2003 that as, as a result of his illicit transfers of knowledge and help from Russian scientists, brain drain it's called, they weren't there at the behest of the Russian government that, but on their own had gone to work for the North Koreans. And these Russians also claim that they're Chinese scientists working for the North Koreans. That in fact, technology transfer had occurred, the knowledge of how to build super EMP weapons had been transferred to North Korea. This was in 2003. And the reason they were meeting with us is they wanted to warn the United States uh, in a back channel way uh, that North Korea might soon be able to build a super EMP weapon. In fact, their estimate was within a few years, those were their exact words in 2003, within a few years, North Korea might be able to build super EMP weapons. This was really striking to the commission because never has, has Russia ever acknowledged brain drain or technology transfer whenever accusations of this sort have been made to the, by them in the past. You know, their government has always denied it and said, no, they've got perfect control over this. But here, these Russian generals were volunteering the information, and they considered it so threatening that they felt that the United States needed to know. When the North Koreans conducted their first strange nuclear test, you know, strange because it was a low-yield test, you know, described as a fizzle, the, 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 uh, the appearance of the test, you know, uh, was not what people expected. You know, they were expecting a first-generation kind of Hiroshima-type bomb to be produced by the North Koreans. And so it was widely declared a failure. But maybe it wasn't a failure. It happens that the, the look of that test is, is, is very much what you'd expect from a super EMP weapon. Now, just days before this confer conference convened, according to the South Korean press, there's a South Korean press report uh, citing uh, South Korean intelligence. You know, they claim that they, they have information that uh, Russian scientists have been working with North Korea on a super EMP weapon. They don't call it a nuclear weapon, but it would have to be a nuclear weapon because uh, they give the uh, following uh, statistics that this weapon, if detonated at an altitude of 45 kilometers altitude, would project a devastating EMP field to a radius of 700 kilometers. There is no non-nuclear EMP weapon, like a radio frequency weapon, that can achieve those kinds of field strengths and that kind of uh, that kind of radius. It would have to be a nuclear weapon if the report is true. Now, you can hear, hear us talk all day about these things and make the allegations about the foreign threat all day and, and, and will. But uh, I would like you to hear from our potential adversaries in their own words. I know it's really boring to be read to, but I it's, I can't actually physically bring, this is the closest I can do to actually physically bringing the bad guys into the room. One of the things the MP Commission did is we, you know, we researched literature, their military writings, you know, open source writings, you know, to see what did they think about EMP, what did they know about EMP. Uh, this one didn't require much research because this first, I will only read a few, I won't belabor this. Uh, this is the one that I, I alluded to before uh, and Dave Trachtenberg was present. Uh, it was uh, May 1999, and the scenario was NATO was bombing the bejesus out of Yugoslavia, the first time NATO had actually gone to war, and bombing Serbia. You may recall that Russia went to war to protect Serbia in World War I. Serbia was considered a long time a lie. Anyway, the Congress, con Congressman Weldon, led a congressional delegation to Vienna to meet with the Russian Duma counterparts. That's the Russian equivalent of Congress, you know, to see if a way could be found to end the Balkans war, come, come to a peaceful resolution of the Balkans crisis. Because the Russians were the only allies of the Serbs. And the idea was, if the Russians could convince Milosevic to step down, you know, it would end the war. And uh, on the first day of the, of, the, uh, of the Vienna Convention, you know, the Russians came in and they, they were furious with the United States for bombing their Serbian ally. And Vladimir Lukin, you know, who's the chairman of, uh, he was the highest ranking Russian in the room, the, uh, he was the cha chairman of the uh, Russians International Affairs Committee, said to uh, an official delegation of the U.S. Congress this, the following, hypothetically, if Russia really wanted to hurt the United States in retaliation for NATO's bombing of Yugoslavia, Russia could fire a submarine-launched ballistic missile and detonate a single nuclear warhead at high altitude over the United States. 
The resulting electromagnetic pulse would massively disrupt U.S. communications and computer systems, shutting down everything. That wasn't said in the middle of the Cold War. That, wasn't said, that's, that was said almost 10 years after the end of the Cold War, in May 1999, by our Russian strategic partners, as they were characterized at the time. Here's a, uh, here's a passage from a Russian, uh, excuse me, from China, uh, you know, from a Chinese uh, military journal. Some people might think that things similar to the Pearl Harbor incident are unlikely to take place during the information age, yet it would be, could be regarded as the Pearl Harbor incident of the 21st century if a surprise attack is conducted against the enemy's crucial information systems, command, control, and communications by such means as electromagnetic pulse weapons. Even a superpower like the United States, which possesses nuclear missiles and powerful armed forces, cannot guarantee its Im immunity. In their own words, a highly computerized open society like the United States is extremely vulnerable to electronic attacks from all sides. This is because the U.S. economy, from banks to telephone systems and from power plants to iron and steel works, relies entirely on computer networks. When a country grows increasingly powerful economically and technologically, it will become increasingly dependent on modern information systems. The United States is more vulnerable to attacks than any other country in the world. I couldn't have said it better myself. 